How you doing? My name is Jermaine Gregory Wright. My pronouns are he, his. Thank you. So tell me where you are from originally. Originally from here from Greensboro, North Carolina. Okay, great. So you grew up knowing the story of um, Greensboro 4? Yes, even the, um, the, the massacre in the 70s. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, describe your experience growing up here in Greensboro. As a kid, you know, I saw all the the glitz, the glam, the fun, the happy. Really never seen anything negative until I got a little older when I started to notice gangs. And I started to notice the, the, um, the criminal activities and the negative activities that went on in my community. And that was as I got older. As a kid, I saw these things, but I didn't know the depths of it. I just saw these guys as the cool guys, the guys I wanted to grow up to be like, the guys who get all the girls, and just, you know, things of that nature. Because as a kid, you see these things, you don't see any danger. You know, you see the glitz and glam. And growing up in Greensboro, I saw a lot of that in, in these um, urban communities. So which part of Greensboro did you grow up in? The south side. I was, um, I lived in um, Hepton Homes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you want to say anything more about that area? Well, it, um, I had a lot of fun as a kid in the area. I would get together with some of the children in the area. We have water gun fights. Um, we were, uh, the YMCA we had a bus that would come. We'd get on the bus, we'd go to the Y for camp. And um, my childhood was it, was, it was beautiful to me. You know, it was amazing. I, my mother, she really did her job of keeping us out, out, of, out of the sight of danger. Mm -hmm. So how many siblings did you have? Four. I have two older sisters and two younger sisters. I'm stuck oh, in the middle. You're in the middle. Oh, yes. So people in Greensboro, of course, would ask, which high school did you go to? <laughs> yes, Dudley High School. Mm -hmm. Okay. So another school that has a connection to activism? Yes. Mm -hmm. Very much. And I mean, it was a tough school. You know, I had a lot of teachers there who, as I got older, realized, you know, they dealt with a lot of things inside. So a lot of teachers that I had didn't really teach much. You know, they were, they were um, broken inside themselves, working a job where they had to teach and not get paid enough. You know, of course, as children, we didn't know that. Mm -hmm. We just thought they just had attitudes, mm -hmm. you know. But as you got older, you realize these things. But my teachers were loving. My um, coach, Coach uh, Mac, mm -hmm. he was a lifesaver to me. Because mm -hmm. he really kept me out of a lot of trouble. Mm -hmm. And when were you there in high school? I came in 2005. Mm -hmm. So as you were growing up, was there a specific incident that made you aware of racism? Yes, um, middle school. I went to ACOT Middle School, mm -hmm. and I had two inc three incidents there. No, four, actually. One, my bus driver, um, I was very small. <laughs> Little, timid, quiet, didn't really bother anybody, didn't speak to anybody. Um, I was afraid of everybody. Even if they were the nicest person in the world, I was afraid of them for some reason, so I stayed to myself. I sat three seats behind her, I remember the day we pulled up to the school and she slammed on the brakes. She turned around and she yelled at me, cursed me out and called me the N word. Mm. And she told me, if you ever put your hands on me again, I will kill you. And I'm sitting here. <laughs> I mean, I'm already afraid of people. I'm now I'm like in tears. I'm afraid. And she called the resource officer and he snatched me off the bus. Instead of referring to me as, you know, as a kid, he referred to me as boy. And he, I mean, he literally, he grabbed me by my shirt and had me, I mean, I was pretty much floating off the ground. I could, I could barely touch the ground. Um, he called my mother and I heard him, you need to get your boy, this boy, the boy, this, this boy, that. And I hear her over the phone, don't ever refer to my child as boy. 
if you're gonna refer to him as anything, you refer to him as the man that he is. And my mother, I mean, she, she was very active in the community as well. Her and my grandmother, they um, came from Chicago, Illinois. Mm -hmm. And they were, my grandmother was uh, very active with the Black Panthers organization. And so she instilled, instilled those behaviors in my mother and she instilled those into us. So those, that was two incidents with the officer and him telling me that he was gonna send me to jail where the bad little boys go. And as a kid, I'm terrified. I had one um, teacher, which is, you know, I was in the seventh grade at this time. I was sitting in her class and we got markers. I love the, I love um, the colors blue and orange together. So I grabbed those markers and went to my desk to sit down so we could draw. Just so I happened to sit at a desk that was previously used by another kid who had blue and orange markers, but he drew on the desk. She thought I drew on the desk. So she came over there and yelled in my face and she twisted my hand and told me to drop the markers. And she yanked me out of my seat. And she yanked me so hard that I hit my chest on the desk beside me. And she um, pushed me into the hallway and told me to continue to do my work in the hallway from now on. So every day I would come to class, I'm sitting in the hallway doing my work. And I hear the students in the classroom laughing. So at that point in time, I, I, I began to get a little angry inside because now I'm realizing what is going on. So I didn't make the situation better. I won't say I was innocent. I would draw pictures and I would slide it under the door to my own classmates so they could come and get it. And they would laugh. And I would, you know, a little mischief things. And it was always you know, a little like, little smiley face pictures or me just saying, hey, to the class. You know, I'll write, hey, class, on paper and send it in there. Or, hey, guys, I'm still in the hallway. I miss you. Slide under the door. You know, things like that. And ultimately, it got to the point where I, when, when it was time for me to go to that class, I would have my class in the, in the principal's office. And he was a, he was a, he was a, um, a black man. And he, he, I mean, he told me, he said, look, you're a young black boy living in Greensboro, which is known for racism here as well. You really have to learn how to pick and choose your battles. His last name was Price. I'll never forget him. Principal Price. And he told me, you have to do better. You have to show yourself in a better light. You have to instill certain things into your own self. Don't allow them to subject you to being, you know, just in a, another little N-word. And he literally said just another little N-word. He said, you are a black man. Things like that got me through. It made me realize, okay, I have to be better. The last incident I dealt with at a Middle school, the little, the little kid in my class, he was a white kid. He called me the N-word. He sat, but he sat in front of me. And me and my, me and my classmate were talking in, you know, in class. But we're doing our, doing our homework, so we're talking. And we're, you know, we're laughing, you know. We're talking about um, Pokemon. Because <laughs> that was a big thing. So then he turned around and said, um, N-word, shut up. I'm trying to do my homework. And he said it loud enough for the teacher to hear. I guess unknowingly he said it that loud to himself. The teacher stood up and she walked out the classroom. She said, and I think she just got up and she left. And I saw her looking through the door. So I guess she was like, okay, I don't know what's going to happen. He said this. And ultimately, I got in trouble. Because he reacted to what I'd done by talking. I forced him to get upset and to say that. So as I got older, I realized, you know, racism really exists as, as, as bad as people say it does. And I had to learn that firsthand as, as you know, a, t a child. My mother, she was always hard on me about standing up for myself because she knew I was timid. I was quiet, I was shy. So those, those, are, the, those are the situations I dealt with for racism, you know, as a kid. Moving to Charlotte, I was, I was, I've been called Coon 
by a student a student at um, UNC Charlotte. I didn't know what a coon was until I asked my mother, and she got upset about it and told me. I've, I've worked a job where a woman told me, told me she didn't want me touching her money because my hands were filthy. I worked I worked at a job where it was time for a raise and I was due for a raise, but I didn't get it. And I wonder. I you know I asked my coworker why. They said, "Well, your face doesn't fit um, the face that they want for the company." And I, I didn't understand why. And I was like, what do you mean by that? Is it because you're black? So I've dealt with a lot of racism. You know, just recently, you know, a guy reached out to me. He said, I see what you're trying to do in the community. You're trying to um, bring unity to the community. You need to watch what you're doing um, before um, we come and hang you, nigger. So racism, you know, and hatred is just in people's hearts. And I tell people it's because, you know, they don't know and I leave it at that. And people are like, what do you mean they don't know? You can judge someone by what you see, by what you've known to, to have done, instead of actually knowing that person, how that person is. We all have certain perceptions of people. Me, I cannot sit here and say, oh, all white people are racist. No, because I, I've dealt with white people to know not all of them are like that. There are some that will fight your war for you and fight with you. And then you do have some that are racist. But you have to understand people. You have to be able to see people for who they are. You have to be able to see their hearts. And I've, I've, I've relied on that philosophy for so long. I'm able to look at people and see their intentions. I'm able to look at people and understand them. And I'll follow up with a question, why? Why are you like this? What made you think this way? Why is your heart this way? Help me to understand so I can help you understand as well. And at the end of this conversation, we both will have an understanding of each other. And I built my way myself to be this way. Okay. Um, so just for clarification, before I move on to the next question, um, when you said that the... Um, the bus driver and the resource officer, I just want to be clear. Um, do you know the race? Can you tell us the race of those people? Okay, okay. Okay, so you were, tell me more about the work that you've done in the community. Well, well how, how everything started. Um, I tell people, you know, I listen to a lot of music. I listen to a lot of hip hop artists. And I tell people, you have to d dissect what they say. Who are some of the artists? Ice Cube. Mm -hmm. I listen to Jay-Z. Mm -hmm. I listen to Nipsey Hussle. They, they give you the blueprint in their music. And I tell people, a lot of people listen to the music for the beat or, oh, did you hear what he said? You hear what he was spinning? You have to really dissect what they say because they're leaving these clues for you on, on, on how to build your communities and reshape your communities, help your communities and help yourself. How to accumulate generational wealth, how to make the right choices and the right moves in life because again, this is chess, not checkers. And I tell people you have to understand those things. You have to see these things for what, what they're saying. So when I listen to this music, I write stuff down. Okay. Well, this is how you change things in communities. This is who you go to in your community. This is what you do. This is how you invest. Okay. Well, let me now, let me put this into play. So I get out here to my communities. I talk to people. Hey, look, you want to help your community? Yes, I want to help my community. Okay. Well, I think you, what you should do is start investing your money doing this. You guys, like I tell the people who hang out inside the corner store, I say you guys hang outside this corner store all the time to make money. The people who own this corner store, they call the cops on you every time. You guys been out here for some years. How about doing this? Put your money together, buy this corner store off of him. That way you guys can sit out here freely and you own the store. You're, 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 now you have accumulated some type of wealth to keep going on, to keep going, to keep going. 
you're generating wealth by owning something in this community. Now you're helping your community because you are now a black business owner within your community. You can take this money and rebuild in this community. A lot of them are very intelligent guys that stand out there. They were just, they flipped the wrong side of the coin. So now they have been, now they're taking what has been mentally given to them and they're sold on it. So from the protest, I went out to a protest um, June the 3rd at night and it got very hectic out there. We got um, tear gas because we had a guy, it was, it was a white guy, he was out there very belligerent. You can tell he was drunk. Was this in yep. Greensboro? Yes. Okay. Here in Greensboro, he was yelling, cursing, um, making threats to the officers. And I told him, hey, look, you can't do that, man. I said, your action, you said, your one action is going to affect everyone around you. We will reap the repercussions of what you're doing. He kept on, kept on. So then as we all decided to walk away, he walked away. When he got into the middle of the crowd, he launched a bottle. If launched the bottle and it crashed over there where the officer was, then the tear gas broke out and the rubber bullets. Mm. People scattered, people ran. But for some reason, I turned around and I marched towards the officers. I saw some children over there um, in a corner where the officers were. And I told my sisters to leave. I said, hey, I told my sister, like, leave. You guys, y'all go to the car. I'll catch up. I have to protect these children over here. There were um, 16, 17, 18 year olds, three of them. I marched forward and I told the officer, look, I'm trying to save these kids over here. They said, we know, we see what you're doing. Just get them, get them out of here. We're about to start locking people up tonight. So I ran over there towards the, to the kids. I got the kids to safety. Um, I ran, I met back with my sister and we all met back on, a, on, the, on Elm Street. The officers, again, they got into formation. And I tell these people, you know, they're about to start locking people up tonight. Okay, you know, you guys, we need to be careful. It got really bad to the point that the owner of the craft, um, the taco um, restaurant, and the other places started to open up their doors to give people sanctuary because it got that bad. And all because one guy, he had, a, he had his motive. He had an agenda to create havoc because that same guy who created all that havoc, he got on his scooter and drove away. Mm. And everyone else was left out there dealing with the effect of what he done. So me getting out here acting in the community and pushing for, for, for peace and justice and for us to be able to rebuild our communities and, and putting bills into play to stop that from uh, blocking us from being able to increase what we have. We don't want to be reliant on the government. I see self-sufficiency in everyone. I see entrepreneurs in my communities. I see so, so many things in my community and the people that live in my community that they don't see within themselves is because they have been given what they have and they're too content. They don't have any hope. They don't see a better future. Like I said, people, you cannot work for someone for the rest of your life and expect them to become wealthy. You can't. You, 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 you're keeping them wealthy. There is a balance, you know, that, that, that we cannot disrupt, you know, mentally. The poor, there have to be poor people working to keep the rich happy and rich. If we become self-reliant and self-sufficient, the rich people, they won't stay rich forever. Like I tell people, like like the project I'm working on, I want to teach skills and trades, because if you can if you can learn a skill and trade, you can you can build your own business, you can start accumulating wealth, you know, and that wealth will help your your, your the lower community rise to to I mean, you know middle class community. Owning property, owning your home, that helps. So I tell people, you don't have to leave your communities, rebuild it. So for that work in particular, is there something that you have um, organized? How do you um, specifically in any kind of formal way, if there is a formal way, 
how are you reaching out to people? Well, I I made a um a group on Facebook that I've been connecting a lot with people a lot. Mm -hmm. I'm out here in the community a lot because I feel that you know not everything has to be done on social media. I think you know you have to really get out on the ground and get the groundwork in. Mm -hmm. I've uh, met with a chief of police. We talked about um certain but certain moves that um, the officers do that should not be done. And that's when he issued a ban on those moves, like ground and pound, uh, illegal chokeholds and things, uh, things of that nature. Um, as I told him, I said, you know, and I told the other officers, you guys have to hold each other accountable. You know, us as citizens, we can hold each other accountable. We need you guys to hold each other accountable as well. If you see a guy, if you see your, uh, you know, your, uh, your um, officer doing something illegal, stop him, apprehend him. Because the thing is this, you are now guilty of association. You are just as guilty as the one that's committing, you know, the, the heinous act. So you shared with him what you saw that night with the um, yes. guy with the scooter. Okay. Mm -hmm. I did. And I shared with him, you know, not just those situations, but even the situations that I dealt with, with um, as officer pulled up on me while I was in my uh, parking spot. Um, he didn't recognize my plate. He said, "My windows are a little dark, and I'm in a, I'm in a, uh, you know an uh, area where you know there's gang um, people and there's drug dealers. You know you're gonna find that in all of the communities." So he came out the car. And he had his gun on his high, you know, in his hand, but had on his side, his gun already out drawn. You know, my daughter in the back seat. Now she's afraid, and my wife was afraid. My son, you know, he was he was little. But of course he's gonna get wound up because he see everybody getting you know wound up. The officer told me, you know, first he asked me, do I have any uh, Indians card that's gonna hurt him? He said it with a smile on his face. So he had a, he he had an agenda. He came to my car, you know. But well, the blessing thing is, his partner came. And his partner stopped him, like, look, get back in the car, man. His partner came to apologize to me and said, look. You, I mean, you have to realize, you know, you, you, you're driving this black charger with these nice rims. You got a tinted window. You know, you want this tinted and you're in this type of area. He's going to think certain things. And I said, well, you know, at the end of the day, you know, you cannot have this perception of everyone, that everyone is, you know, bad. Everyone is a drug dealer. You know, I'm a student in college. I have a family I work hard for. So we had this conversation. He apologized, you know. And that's what I told him, said, you know, that's a good thing. You know, you hold each other accountable. A lot of things that can be prevented out here that you see on TV, you know, these officers hurting, shooting, killing, while other officers standing around, a lot of things can be prevented if they hold each other accountable. You know, so I mean, me and Chief Deputy Police had this conversation about um, the, that situation. We have, we have conversations on how they can, you know, be more active in the community instead of just patrolling and following people around. You know, they had to be more active in the community. Even down with me having a conversation with the mayor, you know, but as I, as I told her, you know, there's a thing, there are things in the community that you know that needs to be fixed and changed. You know, and if it takes me having to, you know, run for a seat here in Griffin, North Carolina to make this change happen, then that's what I have to do. Because you've been mayor for, you know, for, for quite some time now and things are still the same. It's time to create change, and it's time to, you know, bring bring about a peace and unity in these communities. You know, I've even spoke spoke with them about, you know, my view on the parties, the political parties. There's things that uh, they're they're good and bad in both parties. You know, they're they're bad Republicans, they're good Republicans, they're bad Democrats, they're good Democrats. But if we can have a party formed that that, that really cares about the people really cares about helping our communities, really care about building our communities. If we can take the good from both from both parties and form a party that are truly caring and will truly be there to help these communities, you know, that'll be good. You know, we can get rid of the Democrat and Republican Party. There's too much corruption in there in both parties for them to, to, to really want to have any care. Because now it's all about popularity. It's about the money. It's about control. It's about, you know, being the face of everything. They forget what's important. 
So um, tell me more about the protests. You talked about one. Did you attend any of the other protests? Yes. Um, the pro I talked about the one, you know, I attended the first one. That was that night. Mm -hmm. The next day, I went out to the protest, and there was a young guy leading the protest. Um, very powerful voice, as I told him. And I told him, you have to use your voice, you know, for, you know, for, for, for better reasons, you know. It's good to protest. We need to be heard. But when you're spilling you know, more hatred and that's fuel to the fire. We got in front of the, uh, the police station, on uh, the 100 plaza of the police station. And after having the, uh, the moment of silence for nine minutes, he stood up and he told the officers, you know, you, he said, you all are guilty. You all are bad. You know, he said, you probably just gonna wait till nighttime and catch me in alleyway and kill me. Those are things you don't have to say. You know, you can have these thoughts and perceptions of people, but you don't say these certain things. And I wasn't going to get up and speak. I wasn't going to at all, but something inside of me kept telling me to do so. So I got up and I spoke. You know, as some of the crowd walked away, some stayed. And I had, in as his walk away, I had called him back. So let me talk to you. I said, look, you're angry. I can see that. I'm angry too. I'm a black man just like you with the fear of every time we see an officer coming, let me move out, let me move out the way or, or hope he doesn't come mess with me or hope he doesn't come bother with me. We deal with that. But you don't, you, don't, you don't speak, you know, death into your life. You don't speak hate. You don't speak, you know, certain things you don't do because you, you can put this in their mind and now they can get defensive and you can be defensive there's something that happened. You don't, you don't do that, you know. I told him, I said, I can look and you'll see the good in your heart and what you're trying to do. I can look at these officers and see the good in them and what they're trying to do. And I told him, you cannot look at all these officers and tell them that they all are bad. Just like these officers cannot look at us and tell us that we are all are bad. So we had, I mean, this conversation went on for about five minutes and we sharing about the, um, what I've dealt with, you know, with, um, you know, in a crooked police. The protesters started to break down the tears. And then the officers broke down the tears. And I'm sitting here looking like, okay, what just happened? <laughs> so I, you know, I didn't expect this to happen, but what happened in that situation is I brought a sense of peace between them two. He backpedaled all the things that he said. You know, it's like, and admitted to be wrong what he was saying. But as I noticed when I came out there to the other protests, there was a change in his tone. Before he left, he spoke about peace and unity. He spoke about being active in the community and getting together and making the right change that is needed. And that right there made me feel good because I got through to him. We can protest. Yes, let's do that. I'm all for protesting. I'm all for having my voice heard and everyone else is heard. But we do not have to speak the hate. We do not have to speak, you know, anything any negative. Keep the unity going. Keep the, keep the good speaking. Because that's when people in the city will really stand beside you. That's when people who you thought wouldn't have your back will begin to have your back. Because now you are opening their eyes and realizing, look, there is some messed up things that's going on out here. There is some messed up, you know, situations. We're starting to see it now. Let us join, you know? I've had people in my community come up to me and like, hey man, I'm really glad that you did this. Man, I saw you on the news a couple of times. No, man, I saw your um, your um, interview on CBS, man. I saw uh, the video on CBS and things like that. I was like, you know, it, this is not, what's not done for me to be seen. But the simple fact that everyone is starting to see it, I hope that this unity that I speak of is getting, getting to everyone. That people want to be more active in the community, and I love that. You know, the um, chief of police, we talked about things, you know, how they can be active. Um, their HR coordinator, Jenny Campus, she came up, she came to me and said, Hey, look, I'm working on this project in the springtime. I would love to have you come out and help. You know, I want everyone to come together and, and, and see the vision that you have. That this, this is it's important. You know, it's important that we, we share these visions and we bring about this peace because. At the end of the day, if we stay, if we're steady, un undivided, we can never, you know, have the, the change that we need. We're, we're, instead of us, you know, 
come together as one to be united and making a change together. We're fighting each other to be the first one to make change or we're fighting each other just to have the things that we need. So um, the latest protests, the ones during the summer, were um, responses to the recordings of the death, the murders of George Floyd and Ahmaud yeah. Aubrey. So can you go back? I know that this isn't an easy thing for you to do, but um, because you're probably um, maybe around the age of, of, of Ahmaud Aubrey, probably not, you, you're probably younger, but close, close, to, yeah. close to his age than I am. Um, did you say you're 30? Yes. Okay, well, you're actually older. So uh, a few years older. Yeah. But, um, and you're a father. So I just wonder when you saw those murders, what was your response to that? When I saw those burners, my it made my, my, my blood boil. Because a lot of things that happened and has happened is uncalled for. It's, it's because these officers they don't they don't they don't hold each other accountable. They 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 rather sit there and worry about, you know, code and brotherhood than to be like, you know what, no, you're wrong for what you did. You know? And me as a father, especially when I look at my son, you know. He, he sees these things he, and, and he has this perception of, okay, if I see an officer, I might get killed. We're at the grocery store and he's like, he wished to me, he's like, daddy, daddy. I said, what is it? He said, there's an officer. I said, yeah, and I said, there's an officer right there. And he said, is he going to kill us? Mm -hmm. That broke my heart mm -hmm. because my son has related officer to killing black people. Mm -hmm. You know, so when I see those videos, it makes you so angry. Like even now, I would look at, um, have you ever looked at this movie called Detroit? The what? It's called Detroit. Yes, yes, uh-huh. Those movies angers me mm -hmm. because it makes you feel like no matter what you do in life, these officers will see you as what they have always seen you as. But then I had then I realized after the after the situation at the protests, a lot of these officers are afraid to speak up because they're worried about how they would be looked at by their colleagues mm -hmm. and how you know other people would perceive them as. A lot of these deaths that have that has happened would not have happened if these officers spoke up. If these officers done something about it. These officers know they're working with crooked people say something weed them out because that makes you all look bad that, that makes you all being put in that same boat when you don't speak up he was a young kid a few years younger than me he had a mom a father he had some family the last look they have of him is seeing him being buried nobody should have to deal with that because of, of, of a crooked cop in his certain agenda he has. That angered me. Mm -hmm. Because that could be me. Mm -hmm. I get pulled over by a cop, my first instinct is like, okay, Jermaine, don't make any wrong moves. Please, Jermaine, don't even get mad. Don't get, don't get angry. Make sure you're calm. These are things I'm telling myself. I shouldn't have to do that. I should be able to be like, well, let me grab this and grab that and get this. Here you go. I was like, no. At, I keep my papers right above me. So I can easily open it. So you can see my hands. Here we go. Close it back. My hands on the steering wheel the whole time because I'm worried if I make any certain move, he could think some of the wrong things and my life is over. I have a family to get back home to every day I leave this house, whether I'm going to the grocery store whether we're going down the street to a friend's. These things I think about, and I shouldn't have to feel that way because the system harbors crooked cops and they, and they do nothing about it. Like I tell people, the same people from, the, from those pictures of uh, the KKK, when they have their children in the pictures, 
are the same children that are officers, that are politicians, that are running things in America. You have to really think about these things because a lot of these officers were those kids from those pictures. A lot of mayors were those kids from the pictures. A lot of the governor senators, Democrat and Republican Party were kids from those pictures. So, um, yeah, I mean, it, it is. And which brings me to my next question. When I talk to students, <clears throat> who are, you know, late teens, early 20s, most of them, one thing that they bring up is it's difficult to see change because some of what we are talking about now, as you have said, we have seen it in the past, um, even if it's a different iteration of it, we've seen it before, which is violence against Black bodies. And so let's say maybe five years from now, what do you hope comes out of the protests that are taking place now? What I've, what I've been pushing a lot and what I hope to see, I've been pushing a lot for people to get up and to get in these seats. The protest has opened a doorway for us. This nationwide protest has really opened a doorway and has grabbed the attention of a lot of people and a lot of people who saw us to be certain type of ways really realizing how the crook of the system is and how much is against us. I tell people, use this to your advantage. Use it to your advantage. Get up and run for a seat. Make the change that you need in your communities. We cannot sit here and keep on mailing letters to the mayor, mailing letters to the city council, and so on. We need this to happen. We need this change. Those letters we're mailing are getting thrown in the trash. If it does not suit their agenda, and if it's not going to give them this, they're not worried about what we need in our community. Let's change that. Every two years is an is, is election for uh, city council, mayor, a senator, everything. Every two years. We're too, we're too focused on the next president, next president, next president. All the things that really matter, that can really change our community, are just slipping right, by, slipping right past us slip right through our fingertips. And these people are still voting those crooked people in the office. We can scream and shout all we want. We can burn, we can loot, we can destroy. But the same crooked people in these seats are gonna be the same crooked people repairing everything. We need to get out here in these seats. I can tell people, everybody qualified, qualifies to run and qualified to have to be in these seats. You don't need any special degree. You don't need a, you don't need a doctor's degree or nothing. Because see, Oklahoma elected um, a mayor in, in their town. He was 19 years old, fresh out of high school. He didn't have a degree or anything like that. <laughs> I tell people, don't, 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 let the, don't let the system fool you into thinking you don't qualify. All you need is people who, to believe in you. That's all you need. Get out here and occupy these seats while they're becoming available. Make that impact. Make that change that way. Infiltrate from the inside. We can scream all we want. But if we don't get any seats and put, and put this power that we have grabbed to use, because we got power right now. We have the world looking at us like, oh my God, these people are really going through this thing that is messed up. Now let's use it to our advantage. Let's capitalize. Because they, they kind of lost off our misfortunes in life. We, we work until we die. They get rich until they die. Throw away all that. Let's become more self-sufficient. Let's now start to build in our own communities. There's a point in time my grandfather, would, he would tell me, we patrolled our own communities. We were the Black Panthers, we patrolled our own communities. We apprehended people in our own communities when they were doing wrong. You guys let the power go. We had power. You guys let it go. I'm just realizing that they passed the baton over to us for us to run the race. Run the race. We've been standing there at, at, at the starting line the whole time, not realizing that we had the baton. 
that it was our turn to run this race. And we let it, we're just letting it, you know, letting everybody run this race without us. They have, they have already had a head start in life. We're giving them a bigger head start. So now that this protest has, has, has broke out nationwide, we're getting our attention now, let's run. Let's, let's begin. In the next five years, we can have so much political impact and change in our communities, but we have to get out here in these seats. They're opening up next year. People are running this year for next year's election. It's not too late. In my heart, I feel I should run. I feel that if I run and I get a seat, whether it is city council or mayor, I'm going to use that power and to give to, the, to these communities everything that they may have. The city gets a whole lot of money and funding, especially for our, our schools. We don't see enough of it because majority of it goes to the schools that they need to go to, the communities they need to go to, to keep their communities up here. The rest disperse it through like what, the hundreds of schools, public schools, you know, and they don't get enough. Our schools suffer, our communities suffer because people who, the crooked people in the city pocket the rest of the money. So um, you've referenced your family a little bit. Um, I think you said your grandmother was part yeah. of the Black Panthers. Okay. Um, what did you learn from your family? You've given us a little bit of that. I'd like to hear a bit more about the roles that they played in the community that you saw them playing um, or heard about them playing and what you have learned. What did they teach you? They told well, first thing that they want is they instill, instill in us is that to be proud of who we are as Black people, mm -hmm. to never let anyone talk down to you, to never let anyone make you feel less than. They told us to walk as kings and queens because we were born for the most high. Mm -hmm. What they, they did in the community, they were very active in the community from the, just from the stories I've heard, you know, in Chicago, how, um, they were feed the poor, how they were um, patrol their communities, how they were, um, how the Black Panthers, they came up with um, the care for uh, sickle cell. I mean, it was, it was so many things that they'd done in the community and it's like, you know, a lot of that had been taken away from us. You know, that power has been taken away from us. My grandmother told me, she said that, um, I can't remember what president made this comment but he said, in order to take away the power from the black family, you must remove the head from the black family. You take the man out of the, out the family, you have removed majority of the power. You put, the, you make the woman rely on the government, you have removed the rest of the power. So now you have the man out of the home, the woman who's relied on the government. She doesn't need the man anymore. The man cannot, will not return to the home because if the man comes back home, she loses you know, um, she lose whatever assistance from the government she has. My grandmother, she told me, you know, I was gonna keep your family whole, keep that power, keep that unity. That's something that they wanna take away and you cannot allow them to take away. So good moral behaviors is what she really instilled in us, you know, and, and my mother, you know, so it was, you know, a lot, a lot of their teaching has, has molded me to be how I am. You know, even down for her calling, my nickname for the family was, was Preacher. And she told me, you're going to be a preacher. And I would always tell her, Grandma, no, I'm not going to be a preacher. I want to be something cool. You know, I want to be a, a football player. I want to be a star. But from, you know, as, 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 you know, it took me this year to realize it. all these years of me instilling, you know, good behavior in the people, um, speaking blessings into their life, um, you know, uplifting people. I have been preaching this whole time and did not know. When this woman prophesied to me at the um, protest, she, she's a pastor herself. She said, the building that you want that to open your gym in, God is doing it for you. He said, um, you, you want to, she said, you want to build and help your community. God is doing it on your behalf. 
She said, you're going to be a preacher and you're going to preach the word, but not like how any other pastor preached. You're going to be different. You're going to speak the word. And this whole time, I didn't know. I, 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 that's what I've been doing, preaching to people. This whole time. And it shocked me when I realized that all the, all the blessings that I speak to people, all the uplifting I do to people, I'm preaching to them. And I'm instilling these things in their soul and planting these seeds in their soul. So I have been preaching, you could say, all my life. Mm -hmm. you know, so those, those things was, was what she instilled in me that has made me the man that I am today. Now, I still have work to do, you know. <laughs> I'm you not said you're working on your degree at a and t yes, in economics okay good what are you planning on doing with that well um i've been working on a lot of economic developmental projects to build the communities um my mentor he is the, um, the director of um, simon corporation and that's a construction company um he helped me bring my my dreams to life on building in every communities you know, he's been touring me. Um, the, the project that I'm working on is to um, bring more black, owned, black business owners, you know, into the game. He showed me some property. There's, 20, there's 24 units, you know, attached to this one, this one building. And each unit is 5,000 square feet. He gave me that property and told me that he would take care of construction and I'll pay him over time for the construction. So... What I'm doing is, is each unit will be rented out to a black business owner. And all the money that we accumulate will go into our communities. We're going to build our communities and building our, pub our public schools. We're teaching skills and trades to people so they can start to develop their own businesses. And then they can fix up the communities, get a contract from the city that will help the um, poor have jobs clean in the city. Building, um, take getting um, either a building or an old motel and fix it up to house the poor people. So now they have residents. They can find a job. Different things like that to to to, to make change and impact in our communities. That's great. Is there anything else that, that was really my last question. Is there anything else that you would like to leave us with? The only thing I would like to leave, leave us with is just, you know, to make sure that you push the power of unity. There are people out here who would love to unite, but too afraid to speak. We have to be willing to open up and speak. We have not because we ask not. Mm -hmm. We have to be able to, to open up and speak. We have to be able to tell people, this is what we demand and what, we, and what we're gonna have in this community. Now, I'm not leaving it to you to make happen. I'm leaving it to us to, to do it together. And this is how I talk to the mayor. Like I told her, whether I have to run against you to make things happen in this community, or we come together to make things happen, it's gonna get done. We have to be able to voice what we need and make it happen. Great, thank you so much. I thank you.